Hey, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Prashant Das, your host for tonight. I'm an uh, associate professor of uh, real estate in the finance and accounting area of uh, IIM Ahmedabad. And I'm also a member of the Mishra Center, which is organizing this session tonight. On behalf of the chair of the center, Professor Abhiman Das, and all other members, I welcome you to this exciting panel discussion in which we are hosting three global experts and industry leaders in REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. We have Dr. Barry Bloom from Xenia REIT USA, Mr. Mike Holland from Embassy REIT India, who joins us from the UK, and Dr. Masaki Mori, an Associate Professor of Real Estate Finance at EHL Lausanne in Switzerland. The event should last for about an hour, after which we shall open for a Q&A session. If you have questions, please post them via Zoom. Uh, if there is an appropriate time, I will post them to the panelists. Else, we may have to wait until the end of the session. Mishra Center for Financial Markets and Economy at the IIM Ahmedabad is a unique center for applied research on Indian financial markets and economy. We focus on numerous aspects of financial markets in India and spur scholarly as well as industry-oriented dialogue to influence policymaking and public awareness. We shall start with the self-introduction of the panelists. Then I will give you a brief intro about REITs and then we shall delve into the discussions and debates. So Barry, could we start with you, please? First, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's morning here in the United States. I'm Barry Bloom. I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of Xenia Hotels and Resorts, a New York Stock Exchange listed REIT that owns 34 hotels. Uh, my background spans uh, 35 years of hotel investments for a number of firms, both public and private, uh, including time at uh, Hyatt Hotels in their corporate office. I also have an academic background. Uh, I have a PhD from Iowa State University and spent uh, several years teaching hospitality real estate uh, full-time uh, within the last decade. Thank you, Barry. So excited to have you here. Barry and I have worked together on a few projects before. Uh, we have known each other for a long time. Barry was uh, very supportive of our academic programs in Switzerland as well. And I hope to bring you back here at IIM Ahmedabad, uh, Barry, very soon. Uh, could we hear from Mr. Mike Holland, please? Sure. Um, good afternoon, evening. It's uh, early afternoon where I'm at now in London, um, but good evening there in India. Um, my name is Mike Holland. I am the Chief Executive Officer for Embassy REIT, uh, which is India's first listed REIT. We listed in April 2019. We are an office REIT, so our portfolio today comprises about 42 million square feet of offices uh, in four different Indian cities. One of the buildings that we own, Express Towers, you can see there behind me, um, but we own um, over 75 buildings across four cities, uh, Bombay, Pune, and NCR, but our biggest single presence is in Bangalore. 70 plus percent of our portfolio is in Bangalore. We do own um, uh, four hotels, two of which are operational, uh, two more about to go operational, um, and we own a 100 megawatt solar uh, field. So, but primarily over 95% or, or over 90% of the asset value is in, is in offices. I've been in Asia since 1995, um, primarily Singapore and or India. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's 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 me. I've been Asia since since I left London uh, nearly thirty years ago. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm sure the audience must be uh, familiar with your face. You you uh, have uh, uh, it, these are exciting times for Embassy Read as well. Um, the the kind of performance that we are seeing in the recent few weeks is phenomenal, despite uh, uh, the, despite the anxieties about the stock market in general. Uh, yeah. Could we move on to uh, Dr. Masaki Mori, please? Very nice to meet you, everybody. I'm Associate Professor at EHL in Switzerland. I'm originally from Osaka, Japan. Now, before coming to Switzerland, I worked at uh, universities in Japan, Singapore, 
in the UK. I've been working on a variety of read project, academic projects. So it's my pleasure to join today's uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mori. Dr. Mori is an expert on REITs and Asian REITs in particular, especially because of his experience uh, of working in Singapore, uh, Switzerland, uh, Japan, uh, UK, and the US. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have uh, the stalwarts of REITs in this room with us today, but I would still take the liberty to uh, give you a brief overview of what REITs are before we delve into the discussions and debate. So allow me to share my screen. So this comes from Yahoo Finance. And if you, you can look at these two graphs, uh, one of them is of course the S&P 500, uh, the return series. And another one is an asset that perhaps uh, many of us would want to have in our portfolio. This asset has almost the same degree of volatility, but a higher level of return. But on the top of that, uh, this asset gives you uh, not only liquidity, but also a constant, a rather constant stream of uh, dividend income. And on the top of that, it gives you a pride of ownership. I mean, what you see in the screen right now is Empire Strait, you know, the, the, the famous uh, building that uh, the King Kong likes to jump on. And it's in so many Hollywood movies. Uh, and believe it or not, people can actually buy a piece of this tower by owning one unit of Empire State Realty Trust. Because at some point, uh, it, it was owned by a real estate investment trust. So the basic idea behind real estate investment trust or REIT uh, germinated in the US in 19, uh, uh, well, I'll keep that as a surprise. Uh, which allowed retail investors to invest in big ticket commercial real estate assets. Uh, one of my favorite professors of real estate at MIT, uh, David Geltner had a very interesting paper, which was titled as real estate is from Mars and stocks are from Venus. Real estate markets, as many of you would know, are not efficient. And hence the risk reward trade-offs in real estate can, can deviate from our traditional understanding of risk reward trade-off that we learn in uh, general finance. So it, it was found that some relatively uh, uh, big ticket investors who had deeper pockets had access to these big ticket investments that had low risk, but higher return. And it was not fair for a retail investor who could not afford to invest in commercial real estate. So with that motivation in mind, REITs were introduced. Uh, in the US. REITs are uh, primarily a vehicle for retail and any other investors to invest in commercial real estate. They enjoy a special tax treatment, but they are subject to some restrictions. There are restrictions on what kind of assets they can own, uh, who can own it, how is the ownership distributed across uh, different investors, uh, what kind of income they should have, the breakup of their income across real estate and non-real estate income. Uh, they have restrictions on the cash flows that they generate. They cannot retain most of the cash flows that they generate. They have to distribute most of it. There are certain restrictions in India and some other countries, not necessarily the US, about the capital structure uh, and uh, how the REITs are managed. So uh, later on, Dr. Masaki Mori is going to throw more light on what kind of managerial restrictions there are when it comes to REIT management. Indian REITs in particular are unique. They were modeled after the US REIT and US gets the credit of uh, introducing REITs to this world. And before SEBI launched the REIT regulation in India, they sought con consultation from National Association of REITs in the US. And after that, um, uh, some provisions were made about REITs in India. All REITs in India must be publicly listed 80% investment must be in complete rent generating assets. They cannot invest in vacant land or direct mortgages or other REITs. So I'm particularly focusing on points where you may find Indian REITs to be slightly different from uh, the US REITs. Uh, Indian REITs must have at least 75% income from real estate operations, and they must distribute 90% of distributable cash flows where also it deviates from the US, where the 
distribution requirement applies to taxable income, the net income, and not to the cash flows. And uh, on the top of that, Indian REITs cannot have more than 49% in leverage. So uh, just to give you a brief picture about uh, the systematic risk in REITs, these are averages. Uh, and you can see that in most countries, the beta of REITs is below one. So they show less volatility than the overall market benchmark, except you know, certain REITs uh, in the US or in Turkey. Uh, how about India? Well, the history of REITs in India is not uh, very long. So we can make uh, some broad guesses about betas. And this morning I collected this graph from uh, a trading platform. And as you can see, while uh, in recent months, people have been nervous about the moves in uh, the Nifty 50 or stock market index, REITs have been quite stable. And uh, please note that this is only the price index. On the top of that, REITs are also offering a stable dividend stream. And in full uh, disclosure, I am one of the investors in uh, Mike's REIT, and uh, I've had some dividend income coming to my bank account as well. Um, as you can see here that uh, uh, for a short term, the betas in Indian REITs is phenomenally low. I mean, 0.3 to 0.25. Uh, and the PE ratios are substantially high, despite the fact that uh, they don't seem to be very volatile as such. You know, of course, the COVID crisis had its uh, problems across all the sectors, but the REITs seem to be an attractive asset class for investment. Uh, and when it comes to number of REITs, well, no one can beat the US. Uh, then uh, you have some other countries as well. So um, at this time, I would like to hear from you. Nikhil, could we go for the poll, please? Nikhil, could we start the poll, please? Okay, let's hear from you. And let me assure you, this is an anonymous quiz. You're not going to be graded despite the fact that you are at a school. You have 30 more seconds. Nicole, if I uh, stop the quiz, if I end the poll, uh, will the audience be able to see the results? Uh, I think so, we will be. Okay, else I will uh, not end the poll and show the results on the screen itself. Thank you, Nico. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me share my screen with you. Let's see what you're saying. Okay, when were REITs introduced in the USA? And 57% uh, of you are right. It was in the 1960s. And soon after, some European countries like Netherlands, UK, and Germany followed suit in the same decade. Okay. After US, which country has seen the largest number of REITs? And of course, you would like to believe that it should be either UK or Canada, but in reality, it is the country of uh, Dr. Masaki Mori, is Japan. Uh, and very closely followed by Canada. Uh, and Germany uh, doesn't have as many REITs as we would, we would want uh, to believe. Okay, after Japan, which part of Asia has the largest number of REITs? 
And you are right, it is Singapore. Uh, despite being a relatively uh, smaller country in terms of population, Singapore has a very large number of REITs and Hong Kong uh, is uh, quite close. So Singapore has 48 REITs, Hong Kong has 14, and um, India has uh, just three REITs so far. And inshallah, we will see more uh, in the near future. For and this- we, we are still seeing charts. Uh, the results are not visible. Okay, the results are not visible. Okay, um, so I'm sorry about that, but I, I'm speaking it aloud. Yeah, yeah, we understand. Yeah. Okay, the next question you ha uh, we had was, how would you characterize REITs? And 48% of you uh, show REITs as real estate, uh, followed by 28% that like to see REITs as stock. And then 21% see REITs as mutual funds and 3% uh, see REITs as bonds. So it appears that the public perception about REITs is not really as much about a fixed income security as it is about uh, other asset classes. Okay. So um, one last point about the differentiation between US and Indian REITs. In the US, the REITs were designed to uh, convert smaller fish investors into bigger fish. So smaller retail investors were given access to bigger assets. But in India, the way regulation is uh, structured, it is not an investor focused uh, uh, regulation is more of a financing focus. So it's more about companies getting access to investors in the public market. So on that note, um, I will stop the premiere on REITs and let's move on to uh, um, to the questions. So uh, Barry, if I could ask you, um, how do American investors perceive REITs as equity, fund, debt, real estate? Well, it's, it's certainly changed and evolved over time and continues uh, to evolve today. I think certainly originally, and you, you pointed to the 60 year history of, of REITs in, in the US, they were really designed for to give access to individual investors who might not have the opportunity to invest in large scale commercial real estate, either projects or more likely in companies and portfolios. And, and those investors were originally highly focused on uh, uh, dividend yields and the income from those being income producing properties. As times evolved over, over again the last 60 years, I think we've seen more of a, a change in that to where REITs in the US are really considered a, a sector of equity uh, they obviously have unique characteristics um, the, among the ones you pointed out that, that India has carried over from the U.S., particularly in terms of uh, the requirement to distribute uh, income uh, requirements on the asset types uh, that can be held and, and how they are held. Uh, and also, and perhaps uh, most importantly, uh, no taxation at the corporation or partnership level, that all of the taxes are paid directly by individuals based on the dividends that they, and dividends and distributions uh, they may receive, some of which are, are uh, return uh, on capital, but some of which are often return of capital uh, as well, which is an important consideration. So today it's really viewed as, as part of the broader equity markets. The US markets, as many of you may know, uh, have gone through a dramatic change over time as well in terms of the role that index funds uh, play in the US equities markets. And many, many, and I'll come to it uh, later, I hope, uh, but many, many uh, uh, companies are owned largely by the index funds. And that may be a total market fund. It could be a, so a small- Barry, allow me to interrupt. Fund. We will come back sure. to this point later, but to pick on your point about how the distributions are divided into return off capital and return on capital, uh, Mike perhaps might have a slightly different experience in India because here the, uh, the division is, more in terms of what is the nature of the cash flow? Is it cash flow from interest or cash flow from rental income, uh, et cetera? So the, here also there are tax implications on how the distributions are broken up, but the categorizations uh, are different. So Mike, when people buy the units of embassy, how would you like them to define their exposure? Stocks, bonds, real estate, fixed income, mutual fund? Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Barry. Um, 
you, you know, we often say we think of it as a hybrid vehicle. Um, some people think of it as fixed income. Uh, it, it's clearly not not purely that we issue our own bonds to investors. Um, and some people think of it as pure equity. Um, the sta stability that you um, highlighted earlier on m m means that we've we've got a combination of both. We see it as hybrid. We talk about our total return. Um, so the return that, just to take an example of our stock um, since listing, which is now coming up to three years, um, distributions, I think we've, um, we, we've paid out around about 4,200 crores in distributions alone. Um, and that amounts to, I think, the total return that we're talking about over the three years is 42%. And that's about half half distributions plus capital uh, growth. Hence the hence the hybrid um, element of of how we would describe things, and and that is a bit of a challenge in India because the the nomenclature that people the regulators use, uh, particularly around the mutual fund space, is specific. You you know you're either a debt instrument or you're an equity instrument. Actually we see this um, as, a, as a total return and hy hybrid um, instrument. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, Barry, all REITs in India must be listed. Uh, so that somewhat defines the investor profile. Uh, what is the makeup of uh, REIT investors in the US? So again, it's shifted a lot over time. If you went back many years, it was primarily individual investors looking for a return and for an opportunity to invest in an asset class that may not otherwise have access to. As I mentioned before, um, the institutional investors have largely taken over uh, the uh, the REIT market. Uh, for example, in the case of our company, our top 20 holders own uh, nearly 70% of our shares outstanding. And many of those are, are index funds. A number are, are active funds that are active in the real estate space, making a a uh, investment directly in the company because they think the company will outperform. But a lot of is index. We do also have other investments in the U.S., particularly what are called non-listed uh, REITs, which are generally public, so they provide SEC reporting, but they're not traded. They're often sold through broker-dealer networks. They raise huge amount of money, and those are typically sold directly to individual investors uh, by financial advisors. And I've been associated with several of those. In fact, the company I work for today, Xenia. Uh, hotels and resorts actually began its history as part of a multi-property type non-listed public REIT uh, that raised over six billion dollars in the uh, early part of, of the last decade uh, and successfully levered that and then was in many many asset classes and ultimately chose to spin this hotel REIT out of that but the day we listed on the New York Stock Exchange we were 100 percent owned by individual investors with an average uh, ownership interest around twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars. So to see that transformation over the last uh, six and a half years, from one hundred percent individual investors to again uh, largely, largely, I mean, uh, uh, institutional investors has been interesting uh, to see individuals kind of sell out of that and, and institutional investors take their place uh, in the listed company. Thanks, Barry. Um, so I pulled up this statistic from SNL this morning itself. Uh, and as you rightly pointed out, um, the ownership profile in the US has shifted, but even within the US, there is a great deal of heterogeneity across different REITs. Some would have more institutional ownership than, than others. Um, Mike, what has been your experience uh, so far about investor profile? Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, Barry's comments, it's, it's almost the inverse here in India. And I think that that is because it was a new product. So where are we at today? I, I think about 30% of our unit holders by, by value um, are institutional. Um, about 50 odd percent uh, remain the two sponsors, the original sponsors, Blackstone and Embassy. So that's 80%. Actually, individual investors are less than 10% of our unit holder base. Now, that said, um, when, we, when we did our IPO back in um, March, April 2019, 
what we found was because this was a new product in India, it was uh, much more challenging to promote the uh, IPO with Indian investors compared to international institutional investors who were very, very familiar with the overall product. And they saw that this as a, as a good opportunity to get some exposure to real estate related stock with controlled risk in India. We, we have seen, though, over the last uh, 12 months, we've seen a, a tripling in the number of uh, unit holders within our overall portfolio. And that is primarily in the smaller HNI and retail uh, segment. So to put that into context, at IPO, we had about 4,000 unit holders in terms of numbers. That number today is around about 24, 25,000. So we're seeing a, a very uh, rapid acceptance and understanding um, of, of the REIT as a product, and that's resulting in increasing numbers of shareholders. But, but in terms of value, it is still very, very much an institutional product, both, both domestic institutions uh, and international. Yeah, very true, Mike, because I remember when um, uh, SEBI came up with its initial uh, regulation, uh, they mandated uh, a larger portion to be uh, allocated to institutions simply because the market didn't know about it. And in a way, I'm a fan of uh, this move by SEBI because uh, it helps REIT stabilize in the market over time as there's more awareness. As you rightly point out, the number of unit holders has tripled. Uh, whether the share has tripled uh, or not is, is yet to be seen, but uh, perhaps we have to be very optimistic about it. Uh, Barry, you made a very interesting point about uh, non-listed but public REITs. So for many people in our audience, that, that's just sort of an interesting animal. So could you please uh, throw some more light on that? It, it's an interesting animal here in the United States as well, and, and it certainly has met with over time some controversy, but the, the general business model is that a uh, sponsor uh, decides they're going to raise money. They generally raise it through a network of financial advisors. So we have, so, and often it's, they're either affiliated with a, a wirehouse or often it's a network of independent financial advisors. Uh, they are generally most would say sold the investor, no investor necessarily walked into their financial advisor office and said, I'd like to buy this. But as an invest, as a financial advisor is working through someone's overall allocation, they may say it would make sense for you to have five or 10% in a uh, REIT type vehicle. Now, the, the question is whether they should be in a publicly traded vehicle or a non-listed vehicle. Um, and we'll leave that to others to, to debate. Uh, but, but investors will often invest in those. It's a relatively high commission sale for the financial advisor. Uh, but, it, but it does provide the ability to invest across a broad base of, of properties. And there are ones that, that uh, sell into the uh, general real estate uh, market and where the sponsor may choose what, uh, what investments to be in, or there, may also, or there are sector specific uh, non-listed public REITs as well uh, in the hotel space, in the office space, in the multifamily uh, apartment space. Uh, what you often see is that those generally have a some form of uh, timeline during which they need to either list or liquidate uh, the company, which is maybe in the seven to 10 year time frame. So within that time frame, the investor doesn't necessarily have the ability, they may receive dividends and distributions, but they don't have the have a very limited opportunity to sell their investment should they want to. They need to wait for that date when they can either trade their shares in the open market or the company has, has liquidated. Uh, but those companies are subject to the same rigor and review by the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the US. They, they make public filings, uh, they report their, their income, uh, their, their entire financial statements on a, on a quarterly basis. The only thing they don't do is have access to the liquidity of a public market here in the US. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess there's some, uh, there have been some research papers which do talk about illiquidity discount uh, on, on, uh, on such uh, uh, investments as well. Mike, coming back to uh, the question of institutions, um, so your investors, the capital providers uh, are relatively more sophisticated and they might uh, have a good level of awareness about where they're putting their uh, money into when they're investing uh, in your yeah. REIT. 
but I've heard uh, from uh, some of your colleagues uh, and other people as well that it is becoming increasingly difficult for REITs to uh, go to financiers, lenders, and uh, seek funding because if some part of the lending community also is slightly confused about the nature of the company. So do you think it'll help uh, the regulators to put REITs into a separate industry classification in India? Um, so just a couple of points there. So on, on lending, I, I think um, there, there are some regulatory aspects here in India which um, allow or, or disallow some organizations to subscribe to REIT debt. That said, uh, you know, an illustration of how um, efficient REIT can be um, at reducing the cost of debt for organizations like ours, we, we just refinanced um, a bond, we refinanced 4,600 crores uh, with a saving of close to 300 basis points of interest. So, you, you know, it, it is more than possible. I think that many institutions do see um, the appeal of that asset-backed um, uh, bond. So, um, yeah, there are some... Uh, there are some refinements that need to come through on that. One of the ones that did come through just in the last couple of months was to allow FPIs, foreign portfolio investors, to invest in uh, REIT debt uh, paper. So I, I think as with many items of the uh, regulatory framework, we keep seeing every few months, we keep seeing improvements, enhancements as uh, the regulators understand that the market is more comfortable as we've become a proven product with high governance and so on. And that was what, uh, just to mirror a comment that you made earlier on, Prashant, I think Sebi did a fantastic job in putting the regs together in the early stages, three, five, six years ago, to make sure that the risks were controlled and we did not have a scenario like we had in let's say 2005 to 2008 in India around real estate, where a lot of institutions, uh, particularly overseas institutions, had their fingers burnt with real, real estate development investment. So um, I, I think we're moving it on a good trajectory. Uh, it allows us to reduce the cost of, um, uh, of capital for our business. Um, and that gives us a significant competitive advantage as we go forward and do our, we call it on-campus development, which we generally fund um, with, with construction loans. Um, so reducing that cost of capital means that we, we reduce the cost of producing our product um, to the benefit of our unit holders. Great. Um, and uh, uh, I personally am of an opinion that um, uh, SEBI has, of course, been very flexible uh, in, in you know, rendering REITs as a successful investment vehicle. But I, I still believe that uh, uh, we need to have a slightly different regulatory standpoint when we are looking at REITs. Uh, because looking at REITs from the lenses of mutual funds may not be optimal for managers as well as investors. So REITs should not be seen as fixed income securities, but as Barry pointed out, they should rather be seen as, you know, another class of equity as such. Yeah. Uh, and uh, going back to your point about uh, the evolution of REIT markets uh, in, um, in India, this is a topic of immense academic interest. And I move on to Dr. Musaki Mori now. Um, uh, Dr. Mori, we have seen REITs in various other parts of Asia. Uh, India was relatively late. Uh, in launching REITs. Some other South Asian countries had launched REIT before India did. Uh, but we are on the right track, as Mike pointed out, the REITs are doing well, there is public awareness about it. But we would like to learn from the trajectory that uh, REITs traversed in other Asian markets. So could you uh, walk us through how REITs evolved in other Asian markets? Okay, so sure. So about the evolution of our REIT market in other countries, uh, let me focus on Japanese REITs uh, because I'm from Japan. So um, let me share a few slides uh, to show some charts. 
So, yep. So both uh, Japanese REIT market and Singapore REIT market started around the year 2000. So both markets have about 20 years of history. So this chart uh, focusing on Japanese REIT, uh, you are seeing the number of J REITs. So from zero to now about 60 and a market capitalization of Japanese REITs from 2001 to 2021, September. Okay, so you can see that at the beginning we see slow but the steady growth, but then this happened, um, global financial crisis happened and some sponsors of REITs filed for bankruptcy and acquired by other sponsors. And there were some mergers. So you see that after uh, global financial crisis, uh, the number of REITs stopped increasing and act actually decreased a bit because of mergers. Okay, but then to support the economy and also the Japanese REIT market, the Bank of Japan, which is the central bank of Japan, announced the plan to buy shares of JREITs. So they decided to support JREIT market. And actually they bought many shares from 2010. And along with the uh, Abenomics economic uh, policy introduced by Abe, Abe Prime Minister Abe, then we see steady and a fast growth since 2012, 13. So you can see this growth. And in terms of uh, property type, you can see that at the beginning of 2001, uh, JREIT market was dominated by yellow, which is office. Okay, but uh, slowly we started having this uh, purple residential REITs and retail. You can see these two. And later we started seeing a blue, brown, uh, green, so uh, hotel and uh, logistics and others, others includes hospitality or healthcare, okay, healthcare and others. Okay, so that's uh, evolution of property types in a JREIT market. Dr. Mori, if I could stop yes. you there on the previous slide, sure. because uh, Mike, uh, uh, do you see India traversing a similar path when it comes to property types uh, in the future of Indian REITs? Yeah, I, I, I certainly uh, see the fact that one office REITs are clearly a proven um, sector now. There is discussion about uh, industrial logistics uh, sector REIT coming on stream in due course. There's discussion about a uh, REIT or a number of retail focused REITs. I don't think that at this point, I'm not aware of anybody who's speaking about hotel REITs, but that's possibly there. Um, so yeah, for sure, once the product is proven, I think it's likely that you would see other sectors coming through. So Mike, um, like in the US, of course, and in, in the UK as well, we have property sector specific REITs as well as diversified REITs. How do you think the Indian REIT market will evolve in the future? Will there be more specialization or will there be more diversification in the portfolio of assets than the REITs own? You know, I, I, I would imagine that it would be sector specific simply because you've got different risk profiles and different income profiles with the different sectors. Um, you know, another, another sector that I, I didn't mention that, you know, will likely come, but it's happened in Singapore, is the whole digital data center um, type of property. Will you see them bundled together? Um, AI Trust, for example, does have warehouse plus office in India that's listed in Singapore. Um, I, I would tend to think that that specialization around sector allows the investors to select a mix. Um, it may be, it would have to be a fairly developed, well developed market, I think, for anybody to be looking at a broad bundle of different sectors. And, and Barry will correct me if I'm not if I'm not right, but from what I can see, most of the US REITs tend to be sector specific. Am I am I right there, Barry? Or uh, absolutely, and, and the way investors in the U.S. would would get a multi-property portfolio would often be through a REIT index mutual fund that invests across the entire spectrum. Right. But yes, in terms of right. property types, they become very specific and very focused. 
on uh, individual sectors. Right. Yeah, and Dr. Mori, please keep me honest, but some of our friends, uh, Zebrowski and Sanghan Rao, had done this study where they actually showed that investors, as Mike and Barry are arguing, would like to create their own recipe uh, rather than, uh, you know, uh, having a very strong preference for diversified REITs in the U.S. Right. So, and and in, in Japan, another reason is uh, maybe somebody, some could say that for individuals, it might be difficult to think about a mixture of portfolio. But if you look at the J REITs markets right now, 50% of J REITs shares are owned by mutual funds. And end users of mutual funds are individuals. So individuals are mainly participated in the J REIT market through mutual funds. The mutual fund managers are selecting these uh, specialized REITs for clients. So that way, you know, this is special, focusing on the specialization uh, has been working well in Japanese market as well. So Dr. Murray, this question uh, piques the interest of almost every Indian. Uh, in India, we talk about almost all other property classes but no one is talking about residential REITs. And if I uh, understand it correctly, SEBI does not even have a provision for residential REIT for a simple reason that uh, residences in India have very low rental yield and REITs have to give uh, a decent amount of cash flow in the name of uh, distributions. Uh, so in Japan, um, how do residential REITs fare compared to other types of asset classes? So let me see if I have that information. Um... Maybe I have that information for Singapore. Uh -huh. So this is a dividend yields for different sectors looking at uh, Singapore, but uh, I guess they don't include uh, residential REITs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there mm -hmm. are Singapore REITs, they focus on residential property in, in Japan. But I guess uh, residential REITs in Japan, dividend yield um, sits around in the middle, not too bad and not too high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But by, by the way, you know, on average, dividend yield in Japan has been like this. So this is a J rate. So as high as 6% here, but as low as 3%, right now 3.5%. But because um, government bond yield is almost 0%, in terms of yield spread, we are still enjoying 3.5%, which is pretty good. So with the negative yields, you feel at home in Switzerland, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, please go ahead. Yeah, so just I uh, wanted to add in there, I think the residential REIT sector has uh, has really started to come of age in particularly in Europe. Uh, and I think uh, some resi REITs in the US, um, but it's a much more long term established sector where the rental uh, rental sector needs to have you know, high, high quality covenant strength that people are actually going to pay, um, pay that rental. Um, but you're definitely seeing significant investment into the, the private rented sector. Um, there's a REIT here worth researching in the UK called PRS REIT. Um, that is part of what the UK government is trying to do is to channel capital into the development of housing stock because how's it that there's a shortage of housing stock in most of the developed economies around the world actually and so REIT is a way uh, of which that has been able to attract capital to um, further build and expand the, the resi stock. I don't think that India's close to that yet but it but it's happening in multiple countries, mm -hmm. and, and and I don't I would point out from the U.S. perspective, it's been very interesting. The U.S. has a long and robust uh, REIT uh, ownership of multifamily residential and apartments. It's only been in the last five years Starwood have delved into the single family uh, residential market here, which is which is unique, and I think has has been. Uh, very popular from an investment standpoint and has put a lot of and has changed in some ways the dynamics in some neighborhoods of single family residential real estate as well. So now the big American dream includes single family rentals in the suburbs, right? Uh, in yeah. a way. And, and again, 10 years ago, that was absolutely un, unheard of. And we've seen companies enter that space in both the listed REIT as well as the uh, non-listed uh, REIT space uh, as well. So Barry, what are the major risk factors for, for REIT managers? 
controlling yeah, for I, COVID. I, yeah, I, I, obviously, I'm I'm biased my by my experience in the hotel sector, which which no doubt has as the uh, highest volatility in terms of income. So certainly, when I think about our business, that's one of our biggest risks. I think REITs in general um, certainly have uh, every type of capital markets risk in terms of. Uh, interest rates in terms of availability to actually, despite being public, whether you can actually uh, access the equity capital markets uh, or not, which which in general have often in periods of time uh, been closed. I think what you've seen in sectors in the U.S. other than hotels over time is that uh, larger is better and that larger companies continue to acquire smaller companies and have generally earned a multiple premium for being the largest uh, in their respective so there's been a lot of consolidation. That's not been true in the in the hotel REIT space. Um, and certainly, obviously, as in any type of real estate, just general economic conditions and, and what that means and how things move, I think certainly, uh, I don't know if you want commentary on it now or perhaps later, but obviously, uh, COVID has changed the, the makeup of, of every uh, business, but also every asset class when you think about, uh, you know, impact on on retail and impact on office longer term with potentially a real shift to hybrid work, uh, a lot the hospitality and lodging REITs, um, really no sector has been n- uh, not impacted. And I think on the converse side, we've seen dramatic uh, increase in popularity uh, in the industrial space as, as more and more uh, as distribution uh, becomes a, a more important part of the process and as we expose weaknesses in, in supply chain issues around the globe. Thank you, Barry. Dr. Mori, uh, so uh, how, how are Asian REITs managing their risk? So if you could please continue with your presentation. We can't hear you, Dr. Mori. Okay, so uh, if you really focus on unique risk factor of Asian REITs, I would um, point out this managing, man, management style. So the, for me, the biggest difference between US REITs and Asian REITs is the management style, as you pointed out. So most Asian REITs are externally managed, while most US REITs are now internally managed. managed. So now this slide is showing the proportion of externally managed REITs if you look at the US, Australia, UK, only small portions of REITs are internally managed. But uh, if you look at Japan and uh, Singapore, all REITs are externally managed. I think the Link REIT in Hong Kong is the only internally managed REIT in Asia. Okay, so um, because of this external, basically, um, it, it, with the external management system, REIT is just a box. They outsource asset management business and a property management business here. And a sponsor create a REIT own these asset manager and a property manager. So clearly see that you, you see the conf, potential conflict, conflict of interest between shareholders of this sponsor and shareholders of REIT. So that's a unique risk factor coming from external management system. So uh, this slide summarizes pros and cons of external management system of, of Asian REITs. So first point is the, uh, the issue I just explained, conflict of interest, and also harder to changing out external management and um, the, basically the too big control by the external management. But of course, there are some benefits, you know, sponsor pipeline support by sponsor, economy of scale, because sponsor tend to be a large developer or a retailer, a financial institution. And uh, thanks to the brand of a sponsor, we have uh, better access to loans. And uh, especially at the beginning, this uh, pipeline support or access to loans are very important benefits for Asian REITs. So, um, you know, basically Asian REITs Japan, Singapore are struggling to try to mitigate risks coming from these uh, issues of external management system. So for example, in Japan, each REIT imposed a voluntary role to mitigate the risk issues of external management system. For example, uh, for acquisition price or disposition uh, price, they set this kind of a rule. And uh, for property management fee, they set the rule. But in Singapore, uh, the regulatory authority, um, this uh, MAS, 
has been keep revising regulations to deal with these uh, potential issues of external management system. So for example, um, since 2015, actually in Singapore, internal management is possible, but still all of the Singaporeans are choosing external management style. But so uh, if you, if you look at the Asian REITs, then um, you, you should be aware, should be aware of this unique risk factor coming from external management system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Dr. Mori, and I think there is some research on this topic as well. Uh, in the US, uh, the regulation makes clear distinction between external advisory and external management. So external advisory is about investment management and external management, as they call it, is about more ground level day-to-day -day property management services. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, as you rightly point out, on the advisory side, there could be agency problems. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very insightful for us uh, as you know, uh, the Indian audience to see how uh, other developed Asian countries uh, uh, are dealing uh, with this issue. There are a bunch of questions that I have, but we are running uh, short on time. So I'll ask uh, a few last questions. A lot of other questions are pouring in as well, and we need to move on to those questions as well. Um, so um, very quickly, uh, Barry, if you could enlighten us on how uh, COVID has changed everything about you. Has there, been any, has there been any permanent change or how have you dealt with this situation? I think it's, it's it's too soon to tell. Certainly, the uh, worldwide the hotel industry has been uh, gone through a, a, a perhaps a more rapid change than any other industry. It's related specifically to hotels. Uh, most companies had never had to close a hotel before. At one time, uh, we closed thirty one of our thirty nine. Uh, hotels, because quite frankly, there was just no business for them. But when you think about hotels, we often have a grand opening ceremony where we actually throw away the key to the front door. So in many cases, we had to learn how to lock and secure buildings that had been open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, so a little, a little bit lighthearted there, but true. Um, it took significant work of reworking our balance sheet, uh, getting covenant waivers and extensions from our lenders as related to uh, liquidity issues. Uh, in our case, we were very fortunate to be in a position to to raise money in terms of uh, selling some, some medium-term notes. We also had some properties that we were able to sell. So we sit in very good shape today with over uh, half a billion dollars of cash and another half a billion dollars available to us on the line of credit. So we look forward to be to being acquirers of opportunities as they uh, come back. But but the business has come back globally very slowly. And, and while leisure business in the U.S. has been extremely strong, uh, corporate demand uh, and larger group functions have been very slow to recover. And we look, we look forward to, uh, to the, the days, uh, those, those days ahead. But it's been a, a significant shift in how uh, we run and think about our business and what we had to do day to day during, the, during kind of the, the March through uh, September timeline a year ago. So is it a situation of predicament for you, Barry, that this time leisure segment has come to the rescue, whereas you would have traditionally counted on the business segment, right? Yeah, no, no, no question. I mean, the, the performance <laughs> of, of captured leisure demand within the United States, and just to clarify, all 34 of our hotels uh, are in the United States, and we happen to have a focus in our portfolio on uh, not on not necessarily the top seven major US business markets, but our portfolio strategy has always been to be in the top 25 markets and key leisure destinations, which gives us a lot of exposure through the Sun Belt and, and Florida, Texas, Arizona, California, less so than the traditional business population centers of New York, Boston, Washington, Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mike, how has uh, COVID uh, impacted you? Definitely, you could see the effect on the stock market, but how about? Uh... The managerial challenges. Yeah, so of course, uh, the last coming up now for what is it, two years? I think it hit in India end of March 2020. So we're we're about seven quarters uh, through the process, uh, and of course, it, very intense work to keep things ticking over. But that said, what it's shown is the resilience of the REIT product, and you saw some of that in the graph that you showed earlier on. We've, we've collected, because we have long-term leases with large-scale international companies, we've collected 99% of our rentals 
throughout the period. Um, our occupancy levels have slid a little from a pre-COVID 94% occupancy to last quarter, I think we were reporting 88% occupancy and beginning to see some demand pipeline uh, building. So, um, you, you know, in terms, in terms of numbers, I think last year we distributed over 1,800 crores. This year we're guiding to about 2,000 crores. So um, if it shows anything, it shows how resilient the office business has been, particularly in India. India has the unique advantage that it caters largely to the technology or technology enabled segment and these global captives who are doing more and more of their technology work uh, in India. So that has been really the source um, and the foundation that's allowed us to give that resilient performance through the COVID period. Mm -hmm. So more related to the outlook uh, of the market, uh, Mike, I see some difference of opinion on how uh, an American REIT would look at retail and how would some Chinese institutional investors would look at retail. And it appears that we still see more retail uh, malls coming up in China. And I believe that you also are of an opinion that uh, this business does have room to grow uh, in the future in India, or do you see retail uh, uh, taking a slightly you know, a backseat given how uh, the retail business is evolving? Yeah, so within Embassy REIT, the only retail that we have is what we would call ancillary retail, which is supporting the business parks and so on. So again, that's, you know, that's a sub 1% of our NOI and net operating income. But there are investors in India who have invested in retail, who have significant retail portfolios, and they see the growing um, uh, ability of the middle and upper middle classes to spend in the same way that we've seen that in China over the last two decades, um, that there are some that are of the view that that is going to feed through to um, a continuing growth in the retail segment once we get past uh, COVID. And in fact, many of the uh, retail asset owners, and by that I mean large scale shopping mall owners, are now beginning to report revenue and footfall numbers that are above the pre-COVID numbers. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's credence to um, that assertion and but what what retail doesn't have that office have is those very long-term uh, exactly. contracts and the covenant strength perhaps of some of the international companies but then that will get reflected in in the way in which things are valued and, and priced yeah and perhaps retail real estate is here to stay i mean uh... Wasn't it last week that one of the online uh, retailing companies announced uh, to start their own physical retail shop? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we cannot make a blanket statement that retail is, you know, just going to vanish from the face of the earth. <laughs> and there will always be appetite, as, as you rightly point out, for uh, some retail experience, uh, at least. Barry, uh, you were talking about inclusion of REITs in EDF, and we could not continue at that time. Would you like to... Uh, Talk about that. Yeah, I, I touched on it a little bit, but we, we've certainly seen dramatic increases in ownership in the U.S. by uh, mutual funds and ETFs that that are really designed to provide uh, single stop uh, purchasing of a, of a sector uh, by investors. Now, of course, um, all nearly all listed REITs are, are part of the total stock market. So, which is, a, which is kind of a lot of indexing investments, but but also there's been segmentation into uh, a lot of REITs such as ours are part of the S&P 600 small cap uh, index, which attracts investor interest again from people investing in that, as well as uh, a number of REIT index funds uh, as well. So when when you think about all all of all of those together, and those those probably total uh, nearly. 40% of our investor base are index funds who are not making decisions uh, based on the company's particular outlook. They're making decisions based on our share of, of, a, of an index, which of course moves along with 
along with the company. Having said that, we do have a lot of uh, significant debt uh, REIT investors who are typically investing money on behalf of uh, not individual investors, but usually pension funds or high net worth uh, investors from, from some of the uh, very large names uh, in that space who have real estate focused strategies and you know, who are making active uh, decisions on which REITs they choose to own. Mm-hmm. Uh, Masaki, are, how big are REITs in Singapore or Japan? I mean, what is the status of their inclusion into uh, bigger indices? Uh, so, um, yeah, if you look at, I, I think it's true for Singapore REITs as well. If you look at the Japanese REITs, uh, we have a uh, most famous broad stock index called the Topics, uh, created by Tokyo Stock Exchange. J REITs are not included in Topics, but since 2020, a Fuji Global Equity Index started including some of J REITs. So we see that after that, you know, uh, we more and more foreign investors started owning uh, Japanese REIT shares. So it has impacts on mm-hmm. especially uh, behavior on of foreign investors. Of yeah. But uh, the Tokyo Stock Exchange created um, in 2003 the independent index that includes only and all J REITs. Mm-hmm. And we have a similar independent index uh, in Singapore as well for mm-hmm. Singapore REITs. So Mike, that means having more competitors in the market is going to be a good news for you because there, there will be a critical mass for at least a REIT index in India. Yeah, a- absolutely. You know, we're, we're very much the more, the more the better because then investors have got a benchmark that they can look at. Um, and then the point about um, index inclusion you know, we've we've flip flopped in India a little bit on that in the recent months. Uh, we're hopeful that that will come through for the reasons that Barry um, outlined. That many smaller investors globally, and not just smaller investors, um, invest through either ETFs or uh, or a mutual fund, who in turn are looking at the indices. Um, and so we feel that when that comes, we'll see a continued expansion in the um, interest from domestic investors. Mm-hmm. So, gentlemen, before we move further, uh, let's entertain some uh, audience questions. Uh, Dr. Elapuli uh, Vasudevan, he's our colleague uh, in the finance department here, is asking, how should a retail investor look at read exposure in terms of life, sky, life cycle investment models, which typically suggest higher exposure to equity earlier in life and bonds later in life? Or should they look at it like a typical share and invest related to its share in overall equity market? Maybe all three of you would have an opinion on this. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go first. And, and uh, among, um, among other things, my uh, my wife is a uh, certified financial planner in the U.S., and and so we, we we think and talk about this a lot. And I think there's there's a common view, at least in the U.S., that 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 while you can include REITs as part of an overall equity allocation, many people still believe that the real estate in general, REITs in particular, are a separate asset class, and they warrant a five to ten percent uh, holding of, of, an, of an overall asset allocation. Um, because they do have some different characteristics. I mean, certainly, when you look and if you you know uh, in uh, in doc, Dr. Mori's charts, and you also if you look at some data from uh, in the U.S., the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts, that the REITs do have over time been a really good diversifier to equity. They behave a little differently. They obviously provide uh, some level of of income support, not not bond like necessarily, but also not equity like. So so I think really view it as a, as a separate asset class and certainly across the entire spectrum almost always appropriate uh, or certainly not inappropriate for a five or ten percent allocation to, to real estate as someone's uh, investment allocation. Yeah in fact in India uh, the Reserve Bank the central bank allowed banks to have up to ten percent allocation to to REITs as well which is a relatively new thing. Uh, would uh, anyone of you want to add something or should I move to the next question Mike? Yeah let me just comment I, I, I agree with Barry on the on the sort of allocation, that sort of number 10 or so percent. But I'd again just go back to why, because you're getting that distribution and you're getting the growth of the underlying assets. So, for example, when we build 
a new building on our business park, that will generate new rental, but it's also an additional new asset, which has new additional value. So you're getting that distribution and you're getting the underlying growth, that total return. And you know, for us, just to illustrate, I, I, I misquoted earlier on, I think I said 40%, uh, percent. I, I think it's more like 32% since we listed as total return, but it's, it's coming out at about 15% uh, per, per annum compounding. Now, if you think about what we've just been through in terms of COVID and how challenging that's been, um, to be able to give that sort of consistent quarterly distribution and overall return that's in that 15, 16% annually. You know, that, that is for the market we've just been through an illustration of how solid um, an investment it can be. Um, we're in strange times, you know, uh, in terms of the equity markets. Our uh, realty index in India has in the last, again, going back to Dr. Mori's graph, if you go back and, and, and see what's happened in the last six, nine months, development entities have really seen strong growth. And why is that? It's because people are expecting this, what they call the residential upcycle. So developers who've got residential real estate and they're trading, so I call that trader developers. So they're trading out those assets and there's a really high expectation of growth. We, we won't, as a REIT, you won't generally see that sort of peaks and troughs. If you look back at typical real estate stocks over, let's say, the last 10-year period, I think you get a more balanced view of uh, the difference between, between the, the asset base. Mm -hmm. Mike, perhaps I, this question. Yeah, please go ahead, Mike. Can I add one thing? So, you know, Japan is a famous aging country. So at the beginning, j uh, targeted um, retired senior people as a potential investors. So the j have a two uh, distributed dividends twice a year, semi-annually, but uh, the regulator asked the REITs to have fiscal periods in different months. So that if you have, you own six REITs, then every month you receive dividends, right? So, you know, retired people don't have monthly income, but the REIT from REITs, you know, they receive Thank monthly income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was the original intention. So it, 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 it was supposed to be suitable for senior people. Uh -huh. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Mike, someone is asking uh, about the asset management fee or expense ratio in REITs. Again, you know, looking at REITs from the lenses of mutual funds, I'm not sure if uh, this number is quantifiable. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it is quantifiable. And, and just as, a, as I mentioned, we, uh, on our website, we produce what we call a supplementary deck, which has a lot of this type of data publicly available. I mean, we, one of the instructions from our original sponsor pre-IPO was that we really wanted to have as high a level of transparency and high governance as we as we could. Um, so we we took the example of some of the US REITs that puts that type of data up on the website. So I'd, I'd really commend people if they want to have a look at that. And in that supplementary deck, there's the detail of our fee. Um, there's a, a fee of on the on the top line um, uh, uh, revenues, uh, and there's a fee on the distributions but that essentially that ends up as about a 3.2% uh, overall fee on revenues, um, which as an AUM fee is about 0.2%. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've done a benchmarking across Asia on that pre-IPO, um, and that compares extremely favorably, meaning for the investor, uh, it's significantly lower than one would generally find um, across Asia. And of course, that is one of the potential criticisms that Dr. Mori highlighted around the externally managed REIT, which we also are. So one of the questions that institutional investors will always be asking us is, what's your fee? How is it benchmarked? How does it, how does it compare? And what's the rationale behind that? What are the controls in place on that? Mm -hmm. So it's a good question. Thanks, yeah, so if you look at the Japanese REITs, just a typical number, 
Um, so for revenue, 3%, and for asset, um, size of asset, 0.5%, for acquisition and proposition, 0.5% each. So yeah, much higher than Indian REITs, I guess. It, yeah. yeah, well, it's higher for sure, yeah. Uh, and perhaps uh, still lower than many mutual funds, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, we have another question from Arunashish Methi. It's a short question, but with very long answer. Uh, so how are REITs valued? Now, I, I know in the US, there have been different regimes, Perry. Uh, the Green Street Advisors keeps uh, coming up with newer methods of valuation. Um, uh, so maybe we could start with uh, Dr. Mori. Uh, would you, uh, uh, how are REITs valued in uh, Singapore or uh, uh, Japan? Is there a specific method or the generic one? Yes, yeah, so, so the one, the most uh, popular, the number, the people look at is a price number ratio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so whether it's uh, over one or below one, and uh, you can see when um, you know we should buy or when we should sell. So evaluation of your assets on the REITs by capital markets versus evaluation of properties in real estate market. So they compare these two measures. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the NAV. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, Barry, do you have something to add to this? Uh, um. So valuation, I would say, I mean, NAV is the very common method of valuing REITs. And as Dr. Mori said, uh, you would compare yeah. the stock price with the warranted NAV and- uh, Yeah, so a couple of things about, about how, how I think investors in the US think about it. And of course we also have, um, uh, analysts uh, from the investment banks and Wall Street that, that put out reports and, and do, their own, do their own estimates of valuation is that lodging REITs are generally traded in a pretty tight uh, range, which is which is usually a uh, uh, multiple of FFO or funds from operations reflecting cash and not dealing with depreciation and things like that. But one of the more interesting things and in, in, is that here, there's no requirement to publish NAVs. Uh, so... REITs generally don't choose uh, to, to do that. But one of the constant things that the Wall Street analysts are looking at is how does the, how does the rolled up value and how does a multiple that's being applied by, by stock price, how does that relate to private market transactions? So there's active, active uh, market and ongoing dialogue about whether the trade REITs are appropriately valued, undervalued, or overvalued based on perception of private market transactions. And generally you'll find that they will reach equilibrium, which is not, which is not a surprise. And that's part of the, I think the part of the benefit of, of having uh, public uh, real estate investment vehicles is that uh, they, in theory, right, they should trade for no more than private market value after adjusting for costs and, and overhead g &A and things like that. So, so I think you've got this balanced equilibrium, but you'll find within most sectors, and again, I mentioned that the hospitality sector, the lodging sector, um, tends to trade an even tighter range that the larger companies don't necessarily trade at a, at a premium, uh, whereas in almost every other sector, uh, the larger companies trade at a multiple premium to the uh, NAV. Yeah, I mean, and, and that premium is the wild card. So NAV perhaps would just be the starting point. And then that premium comes from comparable sales. And it, it, there's so much of subjectivity there that, uh, uh, Mike, I remember that debate about who should be valuing REITs in India and different groups of professionals were <laughs> coming forward and claiming their ownership of, uh, uh, of the business. So what is the status quo right now? Yeah, so the the re regulations require that we have our portfolio valued by an external third party um, uh, once every six months, so twice in the financial year. Um, by two, uh, so the portfolio gets get gets valued by the external third party. If you're doing an acquisition, you need to get two such. Uh, valuers, external valuers, and there's a cap and a collar mechanism around what you're permitted to uh, buy or sell, um, depending on what you're what you're looking at there. Those valuers will look at um, a number of different means to put a value against the portfolio. Sometimes they'll use 
a cap rate model against uh, the, the, the income stream. So they're doing a, a comparative valuation. Sometimes if there's more, uh, particularly in the development space, they might be doing uh, a discounted cash flow analysis and coming up uh, with, with that and, and compare those two together. So um, yeah, and the, the, all of the big uh, IPCs um, here in India uh, now have entities that are approved to do those valuations. You're required to change your value once every three years, if I'm not wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we, we've had one valuer since IPO that will change. Uh, I believe it's at the end of three years. And because majority of your asset is the brick and mortar real estate asset, uh, the IPCs and regular appraisers uh, would would do most of the valuation of the asset at least, and then uh, that would take care of most of the NAV as well. Ashish Gupta, our colleague from RICS uh, School, uh, Noida, is asking about the potential of residential REITs in India, and I guess Mike has already answered that question. Uh, Pramit Gupta is supporting uh, your uh, argument, uh, Mike, and he says that uh, all the three listed REITs in India have uh, uh, relatively easier access to credit and uh, uh, their interest rates are also quite low. So that is more of an input. Um, there is a question from Rishav uh, Binekia to um, uh, Dr. Mori. He says, uh, Dr. Mori's chart showed higher returns for J REITs after <laughs> beginning of economics. Uh, will we see muted returns for years to come in JREITs with reduction of stimulus by central banks? Uh, this is more of a speculative question. Okay, that's a good question. So, um, you know, after that, you know, COVID pandemic complicates everything. So I can't say anything, but, uh, you know, when I was seeing that the BOJ buying shares of JREITs, I was saying that uh, it's like uh, JREITs are drinking vodka. So they enjoyed a fun time. But after that, they're going to have a hang hangout, uh, hang <laughs> <laughs> uh, hangover. So, um, but, uh, you know, yeah, uh, at the time, they're going to have a hangover. They got a pandemic. So, you know, we can't really see the effect of that. <laughs> but uh, BOJ is, has been supportive so far. And um, I, th I think on that overall, uh, Bank of Japan own 3 to 4% of shares of JREITs now. Mm -hmm. um, gentlemen, I do have a few questions that I had intended to ask. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have time. Uh, so we will perhaps have to stop here. This is dinner time in India. Uh, but we couldn't have had uh, a more august panel of experts like the three of you who came here. And uh, I'm also very thankful to the audience for a wonderful discussion and questions. Um, we hope to continue uh, serving our audience with uh, similar webinars and panel discussions in the future. And very sincere thanks to all the three panelists. Uh, if you want to add something before you leave, please, the floor is yours. The panelists. I, I just like to say thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Das, for the opportunity to uh, speak to you and your your students and your audience. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Likewise, thank you, uh, Dr. Goss, and thank you to the Institute for uh, putting this together. It's a great opportunity to uh, not just to speak, but for me to learn from, from colleagues as well. And, and what a, what a great, uh, great experience and opportunity. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed the, uh, the seminar. Yeah, I also would like to thank Prashant for having me in this great panel. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining this session. Thank you very much. This video is going to be very useful for the audience. This, uh, you know, people are hearing from the horse's mouth, all the three of you. Thank you very much again and hope to bring you back to IMM Dawad again. Thank you.